In this video, I will argue that democracy's best days have passed. If one were to take seriously Francis Fukuyama's prediction that we have reached the end of history, it would be a rather positive world. Communism has been defeated, market liberalism and capitalism pervade every aspect of modern life, uh, and with the modern information technology, people from all over the world are much more connected than they ever were in the past. Steve Jobs once told us in his commercials that we should think different, and certainly it is much easier to do so in a WikiLeaks world where the powerful have a much harder time in controlling relevant political information. Politically, the most important accomplishment seems to be the spread of democratic regimes, which is a rather market development since the 1990s. If we look in terms of the economy, global GDP has been massively expanding these last 200 years, which means that even the regular person in the developed world can afford tourism in different corners of the world. In the Western world, we're also seeing much more Chinese tourists, for instance, which is an indication of the success of economic opening reforms in what was once a communist country. Who can therefore deny that politically and economically we are accomplishing the goals of human civilization of which our forebears could only dream of but never realize? However, I would like to caution my readers about inferring the future from past trends. All of these advances can easily be challenged and undermined if the following trends are succeeding. Number one, we have climate change and resource constraints which fuel political conflict. Number two, we have to think about this whole nexus of the automation of work, the associated miserization of the population, the rise of finance, rising inequality, and permanent austerity uh, policies and economic crises. Uh, and th finally, third, we have to think about wars and conflicts which result in an unprecedented refugee wave to the developed world, um, associated xenophobia, right-wing extremism, and the rise of the surveillance state. Let us analyze briefly each of these factors. Based on my claim that these are serious problems that humanity has to face, I argue that democratic regimes are inherently challenged that the democratic heyday belongs to the past, and that we are on a downward trajectory in democratic development unless we can counter these crises effectively. First, no one can deny that climate change is among the most serious problems facing humanity. One could argue that slavery, for instance, could always exist, that one can exploit another fellow man into eternity and that there will not be any salvation in dramatic change. We might not expect that the working class will ever realize its historic responsibility to overthrow the capitalist economy, seize the means of production, and establish an economy based on social and individual needs rather than private property. But with the environment, the logic is somewhat different. If the environment, if the planet in which we live in is no longer habitable for us, we are screwed and we will no longer exist, period. We have maximally exploited the environment, um, and we can see the images of overpopulation and overconsumption contributing to the environmental and ecological crisis of today. We all need our cars, our houses, or exotic food that is transported from thousands of miles away using fossil fuels. And today we have more mouths to feed, and the more we, mouths we have to feed, the more food, clothing, housing, transport, and so on we need to develop. There is no problem as long as we all live like cavemen, uh, just foraging, hunting, gathering, and using our bare hands rather than sophisticated machines to do much of the work for us. But we're producing more and more stuff with more and more sophisticated technology and, and are burning fossil fuels to do so, which are polluting the environment and trapping the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which um, makes the Earth go warmer. The social consequences of a gradually warming planet have been understudied, which I think is because it's a rather dynamic process and we social scientists are too slow to pick up. So let us talk about some contours of what might happen. The physical effects of more children, old and disabled people dying from heat strokes should be all too obvious, so these are the physical consequences, uh, especially for people who cannot afford air conditioning. 
As the planet is getting warmer, agriculture will be heavily affected. Summer fruits like oranges need warmer climates to grow, so you might find it nice you know, that we can grow oranges in different parts of the country, for example, in Alabama or Florida. On the other hand, some basic staples like wheat only grow in temperate regions, so there will be great fear that some regions very close to the equator will no longer be able to handle agriculture, thus robbing people of one of the basic mainstays of survival. The next step will be for those people to flee the areas from which they come from and go to more moderate climates. You know, Somalia might be one country where this is acutely the case. This category of people are called the environmental refugees, and they don't get the same attention that the war refugees today are getting. But notice also that the two factors, the war refugees and the climate refugees, are connected. The Pentagon in a study admits that climate change aggravates political conflicts. If people don't have access to food and water, they can easily forget being civilized, grab weapons, point it to the head of other people um, who still own something, and blackmail them to, sur to surrender it. There is a rise of warlords, and that means a collapse in formal democratic decision-making. Then there is a problem of resource constraints, which is intimately connected with population growth. We can reasonably argue that population growth is now less than it used to be thanks to urbanization, women's rights, and rising economic wealth. But even on a slowdown trajectory, I have not seen any demographic forecast which does not say that the world population will not reach 10 billion people at some point in the century. And don't forget that it is not only the number of people that counts, but also the level of consumption per capita. In a world where 15% of the world population belong to the developed world, mostly you know, white countries plus Japan, one could argue that it is not such a big problem if these people have a huge ecological footprint. Of course, there's environmental injustice when a few people pollute and the poor people in the poor countries have to suffer the most. But the overall fo uh, human footprint is smaller when a small fraction of the population is using the resources rather than a large fraction. The impact today will be much greater as India and China and now Africa and Latin America rightfully demand their sh fair share of global economic growth. We have already seen the rising importance of China and its insatiable appetite for a raw material from all over the world. By sucking in these resources, putting out manufacturing products and selling them all over the world, the Chinese are creating wealth in gigantic proportions and no international company uh, can any longer survive without acknowledging the significance of the, Ameri uh, of the Chinese middle class. Uh, though there are, of course, issues with distribution of wealth, I'm not going to go into that too much. The question is, will the much-deserved greater claim of China on world resources, um, on top of what the already developed world claims, impact the total availability of resources in the world? Absolutely. It is fascinating to look at one of the most popular consumer products in use today, which is the smartphone. In order to put together one smartphone, it takes a countless amount of metals, which mostly come from China, though some of it still needs to be imported. Well, if you look at, for example, zinc, uh, silver, and gold, for instance, is supposed to run out in roughly 15 years, according to some prognosis. Ironically, in the same prognosis, it says that coal has the longest life expectancy until 2136, but it also is among the worst environmental impacts, uh, as the urban residents in China witness today. Some people might claim that we don't need to worry about rare metals or the resources running out. We've seen, for instance, hearing about peak oil the last 40 years or so. Every time somebody has said that the oil is going to run out soon, you know, there's been a new discovery. And, you know, 40 years ago, we also didn't have technology like uh, hydraulic fracking, for example, uh, where, you know, we drill oil very deeply inside the ground. But we should be very careful about the strategy because of the unintended effects like polluting the groundwater, uh, you know, causing earthquakes and also diminishing returns over time. We are today enjoying a strange phase of oil, uh, low oil prices because of peak uh, supply. 
Yes, there are some oil reserves which the Saudis are rather willing to share with the world while it lasts. It is blowing a few huge fiscal hole into the budget, but they're doing it to beat out market share with other countries like in the U.S. A lot of politics is involved, but while this is happening, we should not forget the underlying logistics and availability of oil. Resource constraint is a very serious issue, and we have long not seen the end of it. We should expect that there will be wars fought over very basic inputs. That has been the case in the Middle East with reference to oil, no doubt. This is a chronically unstable re regime, a region, where the average human life counts for little, but the securing of oil counts for much. Oil is the key input to much of modern life, whether it is driving a car or using plastic. We cannot live without oil. The fact that all of the countries are not capable to realize a serious climate agreement and reduce CO2 emissions just reveals that the collective addiction of oil has not ended and that we need to fight even more wars over it. War is a natural enemy to democracy, obviously. I anticipate that we shall see more wars, for example, waged over water. Uh, the water scarce regions are in Central America, South Southern Africa, Middle East, South, South Asia, and China. That is where a lot of people live, and it is the most important um, input, whether it's the, the water we drink, the shower we take, the cooling facilities in the factories, or agricultural input. Though some people would say that in developed countries, we're still quite far off. But look at California, for instance, where there's a very uh, severe water shortage. Um, and in the second video, um, after a little break, I will turn um, to analyze a second point, uh, which deals with automation, income inequality, austerity economics, and economic crisis.